Why don't we have you give a few examples of like the sales process we taught you in EPQ? You know, if you're already a client, you guys all know this from, from really any industry. But if you're not a client and you want to sell more, uh, you, you probably want to you probably want to take some notes unless you just want to stay financially where you're at right now with your current income. Or if you're a business owner, have what's gotten your sales team here? How is it ever going to get them here? If they say the same things, if they ask the same consultative questions that don't really trigger much emotion or too surface level. Let's talk about uh, what's one good consequence question we've taught you how to ask, you know, for your industry, right? The framework. And then what, how do, t how, how do your prospects typically respond to it when you do ask them? Yeah. Um, one that I typically always ask is what happens if you didn't do this? And if you kept doing the same things for the next five, maybe 10 years of your life. Yeah. So with what you sell, that makes sense, right? Because you're selling them, like, it's almost like a franchise you're selling them where they can buy into a franchise with like credit card processing. That's really what you're selling. It's like a franchise or an affiliate offer. So their biggest problems they have is they want to make more money. They want to have more time. That's why they're looking at starting a franchise with your company, right? So that makes perfect sense. Okay. But what if you don't do anything about this though? You just stay in the same job, same income, the next five, 10, 15 plus years. See the consequence there, the skepticism. Now, you know, if you sold insurance, it'd be worded differently. If you sold cars, it'd be worded a little bit differently. All that's trained in the virtual training course. You sell cybersecurity or SaaS, you know, or B2B, it's worded a little bit differently depending on your industry. That's all in the virtual training courses. Now, when you ask that question, how do, how do, how do people typically respond to that? Because you're not asking that in the beginning. This is more towards the end of that first call. Yeah. Typically, like on an average, they'll just tell me um, how bad it would be. They'll just say, you know, I mean, if I don't do this, I mean, I might, uh, I might just be in, stuck in the same cycle. I might never get to that income level. I might never, you know, get that big house or get married or find love. Are you, are you willing to settle for that? And that's the question we teach you how to ask after that, right? And what yeah. do they say? No. 100% not. I want to make a change. Yeah. Okay. But why now though? See, that's an NEPQ probing question that we teach you how to probe off your consequence questions, right? Because there's different clarifying and probing questions that we teach you ask in our virtual training course, depending on if they're situation questions, problem awareness, solution awareness, consequence questions, connecting, it just depends. Um, what's another example? Like when you get to the end, um, of the conversation, because you do like a two call close now. So in your industry, so let's say the end of the second call, before you learned any PQ, what did you use to say at the very end to try to close the deal before any PQ? End of the first call or the second call? Well, end of the second call, when you were trying to close the deal, what yeah. was your closing thing you would say before any PQ? Um, I would literally just be like, so do you want to, do you want to charge this with a visa or a mastercard and what would what would i mean you'd have a few people would probably say visa but what would most people do uh i need to think about this i'm not so <laughs> sure yeah so you're trying to assume the sale at the end that's what a lot of books even behind me teach you know the abcs of closing always be closing it's been around since like you know the dawn of times so, it, you know, most human beings have resistance towards that. And that's the thing, because salespeople have been taught to use what you just said. You want to pay with Visa or MasterCard, and it'll work two out of 10 times, right? Like on the laydown sales, they'll be like, oh, I want to pay on my Visa. But what about all the other people that are kind of right there on the fence? What does that do? It triggers sales resistance, right? And so that's where you get stuck at the income you're at. And that's why salespeople keep using it because they're like, oh, well, two out of 10, that's, that's really good. I'm making 10 grand a month. Like, that's just the way it is. I, it's only going to, you know, I'm only going to be able to sell to two out of 10 people or whatever your percentages are. And they can't think about all the other people that somehow responded to an ad or booked on the calendar or requested information that they never sell to. But yet they're raising their hand saying, help me. I have a problem. You have the solution to solve it. What's the missing link? It's what you're saying 
and not asking them that's triggering them to not buy your solution to solve their problem. So once you change that, anything becomes possible like it has for Aditi. Now, when I heard you do that, because that's how most people are taught, that's a kind of a consultative selling, you know, it's called the assumptive close. What do, I, what do we teach you how to do? Um, so before we even get to any anything, you just, you first want to make sure you want to ask them, do you feel like this could be the answer for you? Yeah, commitment question, right? Yeah. So we don't, we don't talk about closing in our virtual training courses and training. We're getting them to commit to take the next step and purchase what you're offering. Now, commitment questions can take on two forms. Let's say you're in a B2B complex sound environment and you need to schedule a demo. Let's say you have a first call discovery, then you're going to schedule a demo or a proposal or a meeting with the board or whatever. You ask commitment questions to get them to take smaller commitments that lead to the bigger commitment of purchasing what you're offering. Now, what Aditi's talking about is she's on a two call close. So at the end of that first call, you're really asking them a commitment question to get them to schedule the second call, right? To kind of go through what you're offering to solve their problems. And at the end of that, it's just simply, I mean, closing is really like 5% of the sales process. I think yeah. most of those people think the sales won or lost at the close. Nothing could be further from the truth. The sales won or lost during the discovery part of your conversation. That's where it's won or lost. The close is just a natural progression, right? So we taught you how to ask these commitment questions. And so when you say, okay, do you feel like this could be the answer for you? What, what do almost everybody say when you say that? Yes. They say yes or yes, but, and they have a concern right? You're never really going to have anybody with what we taught you that says, no, I don't think this is going to be the answer. I mean, that's very, very rare. If, if yeah. they're, that point. they're either going to say, yes, I do. And tell you why, or they're going to say, yes, I do, but I don't, I can't get the money. I don't, and, and, you, and you find out the concern and, and we teach you how to resolve, help them resolve their concerns. Now, um, what do we teach you how to do next? I think we teach you how to ask a second commitment question and then just kind of go through. Do you want to cover that for a second? Yeah. So the first is, do you feel like this could be the answer for you? Um, yeah, they say, I do. Yeah. yeah, I do. Yeah. Well, why though? Yes. See, she's, so what you just asked me was called an any PQ probing question. So when the prospect says, oh, I do just say, okay, but why do you feel like it is though? And it's like, I'm asking skeptically, like making them defend themselves, why they feel like it's what they're wanting. And so they start to defend like, well, it has this and it's, it's this, and it's going to help me do this. And all Aditi just did was get that prospect to persuade themselves even more internally, why they feel what you're offering is going to get them what they want. So rather than you trying to persuade them yourself, your questions allow them to internally persuade themselves. What has that done to your like, cancels or chargebacks or anything like that? Um, in the last two months, I've had one refund. Yeah. What did you normally used to have? At least like one a month, one or two in a month. Okay. So you'd have like, let's say, let's just say you had one a month and in the last three months, you've only had one. So that right there has cut your chargebacks back by 75, 80% right? It, it's, it's the same thing with us. We, we literally have, I think as a company, people who purchase our sales training products. I, I, I think we might, and we set, we have hundreds of, of new clients a month. And literally, let's say we have 500 new clients this month. Most months, we won't even have one chargeback. Like we just don't have chargeback. It's less than like a 10th of a 10th of 1%. Uh, because we're able to help, because when we train salespeople, like we sell the same way we train, right? If we're a sales training organization, where we get to sell some weird, funky way and train you how to do it the right way, it doesn't make any sense. So we get people to internally persuade themselves that they want to change your situation like you are. That's how we train every industry. We are a product of us ourselves, right? And so, okay, so you get them to ask, you get them to say, well, I like it because of this, because of that. And then what's your next step? What do you do next? Well, what does it really do for you, though, if if you can get to X, Y, Z goal? Yeah. So you're getting to see their future state again, their objective state, getting to see their future. And then what's the last thing you do? Well, really, the, I don't really have anything else to go over through the next step. Exactly. 
Yeah, well, I, I don't really have anything more to cover um, at this point. It, it seems like we've covered everything that you, you're looking for. Um, if it's appropriate, you know, the next step would just be to get you onboarded. And then I just take them through the investment and yeah. that's it. You can use a debit or a credit card, blah, 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 blah. And then would that be appropriate or how do you or want to proceed from here? Easy. And what do people say? Um, I mean... A, a lot of them will just say, yes, that's appropriate. And yeah. then some of them will say, I mean, everything sounds good. And then I'll get another objection. And yeah. at that point, I'll, I'll And then you have to help them overcome the objection. But at least they give you the real objection, right? Yes. That's the key is because they trust you enough because of the questioning skills that you've learned through NEPQ that allowed them to surface their emotions, okay? To have their emotions go from their subconscious to their conscious where it's on their mind. And it doesn't matter what you sell. If it's any product or service, even if it doesn't solve a problem, it solves an emotional need. You know, if you sell Lamborghinis, it doesn't solve a problem of driving point A to point B. You could drive a used Honda, but it solves an emotional need. Every product or service that's ever been invented or made solves a problem or an emotional need or sometimes both. Period. Take that to the bank. Um, Aditi, any last words of advice you have for anybody on here? That was a great interview, by the way. Thank you. I think you dropped some really good golden nuggets for everybody. Yeah, I love it. Um, I think like my only last piece of advice would be from my perspective, like I don't do the credit card processing offer anymore. I do a different offer, yeah. but I've been able to use the same script even in that offer with just yeah. a few tweaks. So like, I think anybody who's maybe kind of on the fence about will this work for me? It really does like across different industries. It's just yeah. about tweaking some words and some things here and there yeah. to contextualize it to your it's audience. It's true because we see salespeople just like you that, you know, we, we teach them the skill level and let's say they sell, I'm just throwing out different industries. Let's say they sell pharmaceuticals and they're like, you know what? They're paying me too much of a base, not enough commission. I think I'm going to switch and sell insurance. Completely different industry, completely different products, completely different services. And two months later, they're the top salesperson in their company. It's because of the sales structure from connecting questions to situation questions, to problem awareness, to solution awareness, to consequence, to transition to the, how the presentations are structured, the proposals are structured to the commitment questions. It's, it, it, it's, you just take the structure. Okay. And you plug in what you do. It like fits like a little round peg. That's why our company is able to train every single industry out there and get them those type of results. We don't just get results for this industry, for this industry, we don't do so well. Like we literally get the results in every single industry. Doesn't matter the product or service. So when you want to leave your job, let's say that you get a better offer in a completely different industry, you take those skill sets with you and that structure into that industry and you dominate that industry as well. Just a few tweaks. Perfect. Aditi, thanks so much. Uh, what time is it in Mumbai? I think it's like 2 or 3 in the morning or something crazy, right? It is 2 or 6 in the morning. When do you go to bed over there? <laughs> I work night shifts. Just you do, because you're going you're gonna to be on the advanced inner circle training call with, with our yeah, in circle members minutes. in 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> crazy. So what, what do you sleep like, 6 in the morning? I sleep um, from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. That is insane. We gotta, we're gonna move, move you and your family over here so you can work normal hours or something. What's going <laughs> on? All right. So thank you for being on. If you're not in the Facebook group and if you're on LinkedIn, you want to learn more about our training or anything like that, we'll drop a, a link here on LinkedIn for you as well. Uh, Kevin Kevin Rama says thanks Aditi from LinkedIn. Oh, you're, well, there you go. You got a fan over there. Kevin's your fan, Aditi. I love it. Uh, but if you're in in our, my personal Facebook and you're not in our Facebook group, we'll drop a link in there. You join for free. Right when you join, we'll message you over. Uh, look for a DM from me or Matt Ryder, our CEO, or Marco Cortese, our Chief Revenue Officer. We'll message you over a free training called the NEPQ 101 mini course, uh, which is some different questions you can use for different sales situations you're in that will help you increase sales. Just little hors d'oeuvres we give out here and there. Uh, besides, obviously, our, our clients, the training that they go through as a client. So, Didi, can't thank you enough. I'll see you in 20 minutes here on the Inner Circle Training Card. Thanks for being on. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate okay, it. Thanks, Didi. Thanks, everybody. Hey, guys, if you enjoyed these, here's another you can watch right over here, right over here. Join our free sales revolution group. Click the link below. Join us, and we're going to help you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you real soon.